Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Successfully Unemployed Show. My name is Dustin Heiner, and I'm here to help you learn how to quit that J-O-B, that just overbooked job, by any means possible. It could be investing in real estate, starting a business, starting a high side hustle, or anything like that. And today, I am super excited to have my show where I'm going to be bringing on an expert, somebody who has created an online business that has actually manufacturing as well. It's here in America, and he actually lives pretty pretty close to me. And I am super excited to have Ryan from Gray Boat here with me. Ryan, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Dustin. Appreciate you having me. So you and I met at a mutual friend's house. We were at, at a little party together and it was great. We got to start talking and I realized that you have your own business. And I said, man, I love talking to people about their businesses. And so after you and I talking, it was realizing that, man, this would be a great podcast episode. So really excited to have you on. Now, how do you make money to provide for your family without working that just overbroke job? Well, you know, for me personally, I, I like running businesses. I mean, it's just my, like my passion, my hobby. I mean, of course I, I started out as a, you know, working regular jobs, but as I got into it, um, I really enjoyed business. Um, and so that was the, that's kind of the, the route that I've taken to try to, uh, you know, I guess be successfully unemployed. So you went business route, but like, what do you do? Like, is it, I know it's online business, but is it with manufacturing, but how does that play out? So I had some experience from my military days. I had some experience with firearms and my family had been in the firearms business for a long time before that. So it was kind of natural for me as I got out of the military to go into that industry and start kind of developing some, some niches in that industry and start building them and learning different you know, manufacturing skills. And, and as you, you know, I've been in that industry for about 15 years. And as you start to kind of build those skills, um, you start to figure out how to make money in that, in that, in that specific industry. And I've, I've heard people talk about, you know, having those kind of big visions of these huge companies, that's kind of, that was like kind of old thing. What you really need to do is really find your niche and go after it. And there's money to be to be gathered in those niches and a lot and oftentimes quite a bit of money to be gathered in those niches, but you have to be very good and very specific. So, you know, a lot of people will have this kind of these grandiose ideas of trying to do all kinds of things, but really just focusing on just doing something really well is it's a great place to start. And oftentimes what happens is you just, you just see so many little opportunities that business grows into something bigger, but you really got to focus on that niche. I love the idea that you just mentioned about opportunities and seeing opportunities and taking action on those opportunities. Now, knowing your business being that you are, you basically create rifle stock. So I'm a big uh, firearm. I love firearms. In fact, I have a, a firearm right here. It's literally, it's, it's a prop for, for the show, but it's, it's real, but it's a prop. It's not loaded, but um, it's a prop for the show because I just love having firearms. I have my Bible here with me just because that's literally what I love. I love my family, love my God, I love my, my guns as well. And so when you, we started talking about you creating rifle stocks, I was like, man, that's pretty neat. And then that's a niche. It's an opportunity that you saw and a niche that you can go after because me as a normal, just regular shooter, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, there's, you could buy an extra rifle stock. Like, why would you do that? But now but we'll get into all that. But now what were you doing before? You said you were in the military. What were you doing before you created this good, really, really nice business as well as now you have multiple businesses, but what were you doing before this and then transitioning now into where you are successfully unemployed? Well, you know, I, I was kind of probably like just most everybody else in high school. Um, I had some jobs, you know, some part-time jobs. And after high school, uh, I, I went into college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I actually spent more time, more of my time working. I was like a, a bellman and a, and a valet. Um, and I was making some money there and it was, it was nice, but you know, as you get older, you realize that you need to make more money than, you know, your tip money that you're making as a single young man. Um, I started to have these ideas and thoughts. And as you start, you know, you're 18, 19, you're understanding what adult life is like, and you're understanding that there's more out there than just playing games and being in sports and stuff. And, and there's this whole world of stuff that you just never even thought of before. So, um, I ended up getting into, wanting to go into the military. Um, I had some experience in the past with, um, you know, with some Navy SEALs and I was, I was a very motivated kid. I was good at sports. I was good at that type of stuff. And um, I ended up going into the SEALs and I made it through the training and I became a SEAL and I did that for seven years. And that whole, that whole mantra that the SEALs like kind of, 
they don't give to you, you earn it, um, sticks with you forever. Like that work ethic and everything that, that you know, comes with be being a SEAL and, and earning that SEAL trident sticks with you forever. And that's why you see a lot of SEALs who become good entrepreneurs. There's some kind, and I haven't really put my finger on it, but there's some kind of transition tran value in, the, in the, 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 what you are as a SEAL transitioning into entrepreneurship. So there's, there's definitely value there. So that's kind of what I did leading up to um, doing what I do now. That's that's terrific. Now, I absolutely appreciate you serving our great country. I absolutely love that um, we have so many great military people. And so definitely thank you for your service, as well as being a SEAL. That's a, a really elite status as being a SEAL. And when you came back and now you're realizing, I have an opportunity. You had a family that were already doing uh, running the business. Now, what was that first step? You know, you're you're coming back. You're now done with the military. And then you need to create something that's actually going to be able to provide for you and your family. What did you do or how did that actually transition you from the military to actually having your own business? Well, it was, you know, I, I got a job in the industry and I was working for somebody who I could learn from, um, but also somebody that I found that wasn't necessarily the, I felt like I could do better. Right. So you get to a, a level where, you have your own confidence and maybe to some level when you're young, you, you, you're probably overconfident, but that's good because that helps you take that risk that you need. Some people never have the confidence to take that risk. And sometimes when you're overconfident, I'm, you know, when you're young and you feel like you can take on the world, you're going to run into a lot of hurdles, but at least you're willing to get out there and take that risk because that risk is really one of the major keys to success. You have to be able to, to take that risk. So anyway, you know, you work for somebody else, you gain a skill and a little bit of experience in that industry. And then you just decide at one point, okay, I'm doing this on my own. And, and um, you know, finding money is a, is a challenge and, you know, all that stuff. But, but yeah, that's kind of what transitioned me. I didn't jump right from military to entrepreneurship. It was kind of this transition from military to working in the industry to saying, okay, I think I have enough skill and I have the desire to run, you know, to run my own my own business. So the business is manufacturing rifle stocks. Is there anything, any other avenue outside of that? Because you, you wouldn't have got a job working with somebody else who I think is brilliant. You're learning and getting paid at the same time of how to do something that you actually enjoy doing. And then you decided to actually take it on yourself. Was it working for somebody doing that same exact thing that you're now doing yourself? Yeah, it's similar for sure. But, and, and for me, it was a stepping stone that business, the Graybo business you're talking about, was a stepping stone into getting into entrepreneurship and business ownership. Because I knew a lot about that, I transitioned it to a, a, a business of my own that was similar. But then you branch out. I've got a couple of businesses, other businesses now that are doing different things, kind of in the same space, but doing different things um, because you, you just start to learn and you start to see gaps in the market and you start to see new tough technologies developing. And then you just you, you say, okay, it's time to seize that opportunity. It's the right time for me. It's the right time for the industry. It's the right time for the customers. And, and once you have some of that experience behind you of taking the risk and overcoming those risks and, and, and failing, but not falling completely on your face, but falling and getting up, it, those risks and those, they become easier to manage over time. They become, you become more confident in yourself to, that you can overcome those and that you know that you're going to, everybody's going to fail to some degree. You just got to be able to fail and get back up. And, um, you know, that, that experience builds a lot of confidence going forward. It sure does. And it, the, not just the experience of building confidence, but you also learn what doesn't work or what you don't like doing or just what you should not keep in the business. And you can pull that out and keep the things that you do enjoy or that do work or that do make you money. Now, when you decided to create Graybo and create your first product, it, was it something where it's just you in your garage building it out? Or did you all of a sudden go out and hire and rent out a whole nother place and get manufacturing? Like, how did that process to actually create a product, how did that start for you? Well, the process had been tried before, but never had been good enough to produce. I'd seen the process done in other places. And it's not just about making rifle stocks. It was about producing anything with this particular process. It's a molding process. It's a manufacturing process that if you can make a rifle stock, you can make anything that fit that 
you know, that kind of need in that certain process. I know I'm being vague here and it might be hard for your custom, for your listeners to follow me, but, but bottom line is I had to invent a new manufacturing process to make stocks. Um, and so I did that and I did it for two years, two years and over two years before we actually opened the business. So it took me two years and four months to, to get the process perfected enough to where I actually could sell a product that I was uh, proud of. And then it's taken another, you know, f- five years or four, four and a half to five years to actually get to a point where the business is, is doing good volume. So, and so it's a, it's a long process. There's no doubt. It's not an overnight success story, especially in manufacturing. Manufacturing is unique because I think to me, manufacturing is still the base of our, our society and our economy, right? It's where everything starts. I love being there, but man, it's a lot of work. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of risk. There's there's so much, but if you can build something in manufacturing, you have this base engine, cash engine. If you can make it that way, if you can get it to be a cash, you have this cash and it's pr- that can produce. And that's cool about, that's what I think is cool about um, manufacturing. Now, did now two years of research and development, figuring out to make sure that it's, this is done right. And then having the delayed gratification, like having the foresight, like this could eventually work and putting your time into actually complete, completing and doing it right. Did that take a lot of um, patience? And, you know, was it, was there any time that you thought, you know what, I want to give up? Is there, did you need to push through anything like that? Or did you already see the end goal and knew that you can actually get it done? Well, there was no point where I said, I want to give up. And, and the reason why I bring that up specifically is because my SEAL training background, I mean, that's kind of the mantra, right? I mean, there's, if you know anything about kind of the SEAL training and what it takes, there's a, there's a lot of, of um, um, failure rates, um, attrition. And so one of the things that you really get confidence in yourself if you make it through SEAL training and become a SEAL is that you can accomplish anything. So, you know, one of the things, though, that your mind, when you, when you become an entrepreneur and you're a former SEAL or someone who doesn't quit, you have to start to break apart some things. So you can't say I'm never going to quit, but you're in a failing business and you know it, right? I mean, so you got to be smart about it. You got to say, okay, if I'm in a failing business, I'm smart enough to know that I've got to get out of this. But the fact is, if you're not in a failing business, the business continues to have potential and you've got to get up every single day and do this crappy work that you really don't want to do, but you do it because you see the end goal in sight. So that was kind of my, uh, my, my path. A lot of people say that you need to make sure that somebody's willing to buy your product. I basically test the market before you even do anything like that. Did you do any testing to make sure that this is actually a product somebody would buy? Because we know now people are buying it, which is fantastic. I mean, that's really, really awesome. Would you recommend somebody would actually test it out first, but you making sure that there's a market for whatever product they're creating? Or would you say, hey, if you know that it's going to sell, then move forward with it? For my business in particular, I had a good idea that people would buy it. There was already a market there, right? So we knew that there was a market uh, and there was a market of customers for our product, whether or not we could gain the market share we needed was to, to be determined. But as far as in general, I would say you don't necessarily need to know that customers are going to buy it. And I say that because there's been some history of that. Steve Jobs is the, the perfect example of a guy who says the customer doesn't know yet what he, he wants, I know what he wants because he doesn't know what's available. He doesn't know the technology. Um, and that's the same with a, a product I'm making now. I have another company that I launched um, shortly, uh, not too long ago called Reactor. It's a, it's a piece of technology in the firearm space and nobody's ever really used anything like this. So when you try to go out and you try to get market research, customers don't have the base to understand what they're getting. They don't get it yet. So there's times where if you're ahead of your time in the, you know, or the first to market in, uh, with certain technologies or whatever, you may not, you may not have that customer base built in. You just have to have confidence that what you're going to deliver the customer is super valuable and that they will end up seeing that value. And so I wouldn't say by any means you have to have that, that customer feedback right away. You just have to have confidence that eventually you can portray that value to your customer. When you say portray that value, is it because of the, the product is quality and they, they understand it? Is that what you're actually meaning? Yeah, well, you have to, you have to, you know, there's a trade, right? You get, they give you, the customer gives you money and you give them a product. And 
And for the customer to give you money, they have to find something valuable. They're not just going to give you money for nothing, right? So they have to be able to use the product in a way that they enjoy or the way, a way that's useful to them in some way. And so part of business is relaying, it's marketing, right? But it's relaying the value to a customer, like relaying, this is what you can do. This is how it'll make your life easier. This is how it'll bring you joy. And that's part of, of, of the business world and, and the marketing world is, is to, to tell people, tell people how they can get value out of this. And, and so, yeah. Now, once you understand there's a product that somebody's going to buy and you actually have the ability to make it, you're going to have to manufacture it. That sounds pretty daunting to somebody like me who's never done manufacturing. Now, I did have a skateboard manufacturing business where I literally cut out the boards and put the trucks on there, screws and grip tape and wheels and all that sort of stuff. I created that, but that was all me. Now, when you're creating a manufacturing business, is it something that you would suggest that somebody should be in their garage or in their basement doing themselves or should they and, and get sales or should they start maybe beyond that? Or like, what is your route to get started with the manufacturing? Well, everybody's different. But if I were to give one answer, I would say, yes, start, start yourself, learn the process yourself, do the thing yourself. That's all, what I always do. When I, when I started my business, I spent two years developing the process. I got a couple of years into the business and I realized I needed to do what was called CNC machining. Um, totally a different type of manufacturing, but still manufacturing. I, had, I bought a CNC machine, never ran one. I learned how to run it. I learned how to program it. And what it does is it gives you the ability to talk smartly uh, to your employees who you bring on, to your customers. It, it gives you the ability to make good sound decisions on, on what, how to, what, you know, what direction to go in your business. And so if you don't know anything about what you're, you don't have to be an expert. Um, and as a matter of fact, entrepreneurs are rarely experts at anything. And that's kind of part of the beauty of it. And not beauty, but that's part of the, um, what defines an entrepreneur. But um, yeah, you know, you just need to have a good understanding of everything. And that way you can make good sound decisions for your business going forward. Now, a CNC machine is not cheap. I mean, it's definitely not cheap, but it's a fa valuable, fantastic tool for your business. Uh, is should somebody maybe bootstrap it before they actually buy a CNC machine to make sure that there's more demand that is necessary for the product to actually number one provide for yourself, but then also provide for your employees. What are your thoughts about outlay of capital to buy tools that would definitely help you in the future, but at the same time, maybe you have to take a loan or something like that. That's a, that's a little daunting for a lot of people. It is. And you know, CNC machines are expensive. I mean, you're going to spend uh, on a new CNC machine on a, a kind of an average CNC machine, you're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars and you can get, you can get financing for it. And, uh, but you're also going to spend money on tools and fixturing. Um, so I would say that's more than most people are willing to just take on if they don't know anything about CNC machining, right? I would say if you really want to get a CNC machine and you have a product that you want to make, but you don't know anything about CNC, go get a job, uh, go or, or learn that skill at some, you know, uh, at a, at a school or some education and then get, get a job, learn how to run that machine so that when the, you, you put that money into it, you get the machine, you put it on the floor, you can start running it immediately and running parts immediately because what you don't want to do is you don't want to get that machine in there and it's, costing you money every month and you're just bleeding money out and you're like, well, I can't produce anything of value here because even some, even experienced machinists make mistakes, you know, and there's, there's all kinds of different segments of machining that people specialize in. So what do you, what are you going to specialize? There's just so much to it that yes, have some experience. If you're going to buy a CNC machine, have some experience before you put it on the floor. Otherwise your money is just going to go down the drain for a long time. <laughs> and I love that idea where you said you work to learn and you go get a job. If learning something that is going to help you in your business. Now I would actually pay Warren Buffett for me to work for him. I wouldn't want to get paid. I'd pay him money to let me work for him because I would learn so much from him just by being around him, seeing how he trades his stock, how he lives his life, all that sort of stuff. And I love that idea. Now let's switch a little bit to now selling the product because let's say you have the best product in the world. You have so much inventory. You have just warehouses of warehouses of inventory. What was the, what's the first step that we need to do to start moving 
this inventory into our customers' hands. Number one, that they know it, that we're alive, and number two, that they should buy it. Number three, that they would actually convert and actually buy. So one of the one of the things, at least in my industry, and I think this is probably across every industry, that's the most important thing you can do is build your brand. So people overlook, and it's really, it's almost really hard to understand what a brand means to a company, right? Like really truly. And, and when when people buy big companies, if someone were to buy Coca-Cola, they buy the brand. They don't buy the sugar in the water, right? <laughs> I mean, they buy the brand. That's how brands are so powerful. So you have to build that brand. What building your brand does is build confidence in the consumer. I mean, plain and simple. The more product you can start slowly getting out there, the more consumers see your product and the more reviews and the more, you know, the word spreads kind of organically, the better your brand is going to get. And then the more people are just going to slowly start trickling and that slow trickle turns into this kind of exponential growth. So building your brand, that's really important. And the, you do it in a couple of ways, building your brand, you got to have a logo and people get wrapped up around the name of your company. No one cares. You know what, you know what makes the name of your company cool? Your company, like your product, what you stand for. You can have the dumbest name in the world. You think people thought Coca-Cola was a cool name before, they, but it's the most iconic name now in the world, right? So you got to, you got to build that brand and you got to get confidence, you know, in that customer. And so you know, that's what is going to start driving those sales. Then you, you know, you want to, it depends, every business is different. There's distribution, there's online sales, there's sales, uh, B2B sales. So it depends on what you do and, and where you are. Um, you have to just start um, really focusing. I think when you're new, you focus on one thing at a time. When we, when we first started, we focused on manufacturing. So to sell the product, we brought on a distributor and that distributor was, was focused on selling. We didn't want to, I didn't want to spend the money to sell a product and, and to, 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 to get a sales team in place when I'm already spending the money getting my manufacturing up. I just wanted to make stuff and sell it to one customer and not them sell it. Now, as we were growing and as I can, I can kind of step back a little bit from the manufacturing because that's established more. Now I look at my sales channels and okay, I'm in distribution. Now I got to go B2B and now I got to get an online presence and I have all of those now. So it's just, you know, you got to focus um, one at a time, but as you can kind of, as, as you build something, as you build manufacturing for me, you can back off as, as you have people running that, you can back off and then focus on other parts of the business. See, I would have thought go directly to an online business, online store and just put it out there for sale but you didn't, it sounds like you went with a distributor first, which I think is smart because you get a lot more inventory pumped through your system and your business. So you have work for your employees. You can actually pay for the CNC machine. It sounds like, is it hard to find a distributor for your products? Yeah, my, I mean, our products are a niche product. There's no doubt. There's a, only a few select um, distributors out there. And so, um, yeah, it, it was difficult. We got lucky, to be honest. We found one right away that wanted that, you know, they had the space in their inventory. They had the capital to invest. They had everything that they needed to bring us on board. It was the right match at the right time, but it could have easily gone the other way where it, the distributors just weren't interested at the time. We were too new. There was, uh, they, they had too much inventory there already. They didn't have the capital to invest, all that stuff. We just got, in a lot of ways, we got lucky. Um, but yeah, it, it all depends on your business. Like you really have to, that's what the kind of the business, the, that's what the entrepreneur does. He, he really understands the landscape and navigates through that landscape. He understands that there's different types of sales and he understands that he can't go after all of them at once. And maybe he takes one route or he takes two of the three or, you know, it's all kind of that strategic thinking and planning. That's interesting. Now you went from distributor. Now, now you have an online presence and there was a middle one. What was that middle one in there? B2B. B2B. What does B2B look like? The business to business. For us, that's our biggest, that's our biggest uh, revenue stream. So as stock makers, we sell stocks to some of the biggest companies, rifle makers in the, in the country and in the world. So, you know, we have cu customers like Remington and Winchester and Bergera and, you know, I can go on, but those are, that's a B2B. That's us making a part that goes on to a product that they sell through Cabela's and Sportsman's Warehouse. And um, they sell, they have their online outlets and sometimes it's Bass Pro. So all these, you know, and then other smaller gun, uh, gun 
uh, dealers, uh, um, gun shops uh, throughout the, the the states and even internationally. And so they, these companies like Remington, they'd actually buy the stocks from you and put it on their parts before or their guns before they sell them. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Remington will have, let's just say, let's take them as an example. They'll have, let's just say 30 different rifles you can buy, right. As a consumer and a handful of them might be with a stock, uh, Graybo stock, um, two or three. And it, it, what a company like Remington wants to do is they want to spread out their vendors. They don't want to rely on one vendor. So what they do is they spread it out. So if one vendor goes out of business, they're not totally you know, screwed. They will actually just fill that gap with another vendor. So our business is, is like that. We'll, we'll have two or three, one, sometimes one, sometimes up to eight lines on a, in a particular manufacturing uh, manufacturer, and they'll go out and they'll just sell those to the gun. gun stores. Man, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, having your online presence, so we have, we build our brand, we get a distributor, we, if, we, if we can, hopefully we'll be able to find one, then try to get some B2B where we're actually working with the businesses. Now, having your online presence, is there a reason why we would put that last or should we put it forward or first? Or what are your thoughts about making sure that we have an online presence actually selling it from there? It's, in, it's really important. Um, and again, depending on your business will depend on what you do first. We did it last because it required more attention from my employees, right? So remember when I said I wanted the distributor because that doesn't require more attention from my employees. That allows me to make what I'm good at making and then to um, sell, sell it to one customer. And it's the same with the B2B is we make a bunch of product and we sell it to one customer or two or three or 10, but not a thousand or 2000 or 3000, right? We, we really keep our customer list low and the volume per customer is high. The last thing is the online sales where you're selling to each individual person that requires a different, different level of commitment from your, you internally at your company that requires full-time employees to manage your website, to make sure that, uh, um, you know, shipping gets done, quality gets done at, at, on an individual level. And for us, it's a little different for us when we sell to distributors or to business to business, we call them OEMs, but B2B is a more common term. Um, we sell very limited product and it's, it's, it's all very similar, right? When we sell to individuals, it's, it can be customized much more. So we have a lot more quality uh, assurances that go into to individual uh, orders. It takes a lot. As a matter of fact, we failed the first time we tried to launch our online store. We did a pretty bad job and we had to kind of pull back and say, okay, how do we fix this? And, and what, what did we do wrong? And then we relaunched it again the next year and now it's doing great but we had we made a lot of mistakes that first time and which probably cost us some goodwill amongst our customers and thinking about customer service too like if you have any problems or the customer has any problems with it that's another employee or at least a section of your business you have to actually you know figure out especially making sure that the customers are happy that your brand continually gets out now i had thought about patenting your products is that something that's necessary? Should we absolutely do that? Or should we look into it? What are your thoughts about making, making a patent so we can protect our, our property? Patents are good and they're bad. I mean, depend, again, everything depends, right? So I have a patent. One of my, one of my companies, React, the newer company, we filed for a patent on our product. Grabo, we don't have patents on any of our products. Here's the reason. We come into an industry for, with Grabo that's already established. We're just trying to take market share. Um, we're not going to get, there's nothing patentable really. I mean, we could probably find something somewhere on the stock that's patentable, but it would be so easy to go around it. We would just be throwing money away. Um, so in that case, the easier way to go is to, per, is to protect your intellectual property. And what that means is personally just keep your, what's, what's valuable to your company. So for us, that's our, our process. The way that we make stocks is the most valuable thing just to keep that to ourselves. Don't let people, you know, that we don't know back in the shop looking around and stuff like that. So it's cheaper that way. Um, and, and oftentimes when you don't have a patentable product, it's just the better way to go. Now, patents in the long run, if you can patent something and you think your company and that product is gonna be valuable, it's definitely worth doing. Um, primarily because if you ever sell your company, patents are 
they'll pay a lot, people pay a lot of money for patents. So you might spend $30,000 on your patent, but you may end up getting millions of dollars in return for that patent um, when, it's, when the company sold. So there's some goods and bads. You have to just get into it and understand and talk to your lawyers and you know, just kind of work your way through each product and whether it's worth patenting or not. And they're all different. And so I can't give you, a, none, of, none of these answers are cut and dry, but <laughs> give you some guidance, I guess. <laughs> so let me ask you, because I'm piecing a couple of things together. So with having a patent, or not having a patent and you're protecting your intellectual property, making sure that you can, your process of creating whatever it is, is protected. That's one thing. But original, or maybe 10 minutes ago, you said, go to work for somebody and learn that process. So I'm piecing both those together. If somebody comes and works for you, learns the entire process, becomes a master at it, and then says, you know what? I can do this myself. Do you have them sign like a non-compete clause or anything like that to protect your intellectual property? It's a good question. It's a good question to ask. And it would be, you would think it might be reasonable to do that, but we don't like, it's hard to explain why, but we just don't have that. It's such a niche industry for us. It's even if you can make the product efficiently, like it took me two years and I already know I need to change the process, but I've, I've taken one step and I need to take another step and I'll probably, it's, it was such a difficult path that I'm just not worried that people are going to follow me. So, you know, it's possible that someone does, but I just don't, I don't think it's even worth my time worrying about it. You know, for me, I just look forward. I try to just look forward and I try to say, I'm, 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 I'm running forward. And if, if you can catch a wake and you think you can catch me, then good on you. Right. Like now, again, in my other business, it's a technology based business. That's a different story. That's technology. That's stuff that can be easily stolen. And that can, that, that, there's, there's all kinds of people out there that understand code and programming. You download this information and you can give it to anybody and, you know, and, and they can understand it and replicate it. It's, it's a different business, different process. And so, but yes, a good question on, on you. And there may be some businesses and a lot of businesses do do that. They, they make you sign. Um, I think it's called like a non-compete or something for their employees where they can't, what, if they, if they leave, they are not allowed to, I don't know the stipulations, but they're not allowed to basically get into business. In yeah, context. they can't basically steal the information from you and then use it to the detriment of your company. Yeah, that's that's the non-compete. Now, I was also thinking of, I like how you have a high barrier to entry for other people yeah. to get in this, like having a CNC machine, getting this whole process and everything. Like that's something that, like if you go out and start your own, let's say carpet cleaning business, and you hire an employee, buy them a truck, or you know have a have a, a company truck that they drive around, and they start servicing their customers. Well, the barrier to entry is literally them just buying a truck or buying a van, getting a carpet cleaning uh, equipment, and then just start calling all your customers and try to take your. So the barrier entry is very very small. But in your business, it's going to be much higher because there's a lot more outlay of capital, which is a, something to think about when you're starting a business and trying to scale it. Now. When you're thinking about scaling your business, that's what I love to see is businesses go from being, you know, just a mom and pop store or restaurant or business to where they are starting to actually employ people. They're giving people great paying jobs so that they can feed their families, but you're also providing a service to your customers. How do you then scale the business to make it bigger? Is it more sales? Is it refining your products? Or what do you do to scale your business? There's a lot you can do. Um, I can only speak and I should only speak to my business specifically, but for us, um, it starts with, the, it's really mostly in, in the process. And so our process, um, ha- what you have to do, usually processes start out manual, right? That's just because in the beginning, people are cheaper upfront, but they're more expensive in the long term. It just, that's how it works. I'm not trying to be a jerk. It's just how the numbers play out, right? So what you do is when you don't have any money in the up front, you, you just hire people to, to do the work. But what you realize is as those people are doing the work, it's hard to scale people. It really is hard to scale people. So if you can automate that process more, yeah, you're going to spend more money up front on machines, but if they pay for themselves pretty quick. And those jobs, the jobs where the machines do most of the work, there still needs to be people running those machines. And then those jobs become much more desirable because they're not so labor intensive and working with, you know, materials that are kind of undesirable to work with. So the jobs become higher paying. There's less jobs technically, but 
in, the, in reality, if you can scale, you may still need the same amount of people you did in the beginning. You could, but you're, you've just grown. And you've been able to grow, right? And the jobs are higher paying jobs. They're more skilled jobs. And, and I think in the long term, it's better. Um, but yeah, that's how you start. You start with people and you start with people just slugging away. <laughs> and then, then you scale your process to something that's more automated. And, and that you can just, one of the hard things about production is you want to be able to, production goes up and down. Your, your sales are going to go up and down. You got to be able to shut off a machine if production's not running and lower your overhead as much as possible. It's really, it gets really difficult when you have to lay people off. That is a really hard, hard job, hard thing to do. You would re much rather turn a machine off and just let it sit there. Yeah, it's costing you a little bit of money, but it's not costing you a ton of money. Whereas if you have a bunch of people sitting there not doing anything, then you're, that's, that costs you money. That costs you a lot of money. So with, so that's, I love the idea of making sure we're watching our expenses. How do we then increase our income? Like, do we go out and get more uh, or other companies that are for the B2B or more distributors or try to get this online sales going? How do we increase the amount of sales that we have? Well, I think it's the engine of sales is your marketing, is your brand. Okay. So your brand, your, your brand is what people, really what people think of you, what they, when they hear your name what kind of emotions do they feel is it good is it bad that's kind of your what your brand does and then you got to relay that information that's your marketing that's what drives the, the core business the hardcore people that's what drives them back and that's what spreads those hardcore customers um, and yeah you can go out and bang on doors and some businesses are still like that but it's just not like that anymore really i mean you know I would imagine most sophisticated companies anymore, they're not salesmen who are going to knock on doors and making cold calls. They're really focusing on brand because with the internet, people have access to all this stuff. All you got to do, well, not all you got to do, but one of the things you just got to get your brand. You, you've got to have a brand that's valuable and that promotes like this good emotion to people. And you've got to get your word out. People have to see you. Gary Vee says it all the time. It's a game of attention. 100% correct. It's a game of attention. You have to have the attention. And then when you get the attention, you have to have a good, solid brand that people trust. I don't even know if I like the word sales because sales has that old mantra of like, I'm just going to go and sell you something like, you know, one-to-one, -one, I'm going to sell you this. And it's, I just don't see that a lot. What I see is people going online and going back and forth to the website 10 times before they buy and going to research on on, on, on reviews and all over the place, it's, they never even interact with anybody. It's not a, it's not a sale like it used to be. It's more just this branding presence. It gives you confidence. It gives your customer confidence that they, they can buy from you without ever talking to anyone. And they're going to get a product that's, that, that, that's valuable to them. That's a great point. Man, Ryan, okay, so let's jump into the rapid fire round because there are some other questions I would definitely want to ask you. Now, the rapid fire round, I basically ask you the questions, take as long as, as time as you want. It's not like you have to wrap, you know, get them out really fast. Now, other than getting started, because that's usually the first thing we need to do is getting started in our business, but you've given us lots of great advice on how we can actually start a manufacturing business. Is there anything else we might have missed? Like, is there any little bit of advice that you can give to somebody who said, I have an idea for a product, I really want to get going. What other bit of advice that you can give to somebody about starting a manufacturing business? You're going to need money at some point or another, period. Like, you may not need it in the beginning because it's just you working. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, depends on what you're doing. But at some point in your process, you're going to need money. Unless you're somehow independently wealthy, which we're probably not talking to those type of people today. We're probably talking to the people who are like trying, you know, entrepreneurs trying to get to the point to where they can generate capital. Um, and so you've got to also be skilled. Your network, I know this kind of sounds cliche, but your network is huge. Like the people who invest in my companies are end up, not I shouldn't say end up. There are people within my industry that know me, but we're, you, you could say we're friends. We have business relationships. There's no doubt. And we know how to, how to separate our business and our friendship, but your relationships with people, um, Never having to go, never having to go to a uh, an investor seminar and pitch up and in front. How that's the if you can never have to do that, that's beautiful. And the way you that way not to do that is to just dig into the industry and just start knowing people. Just start 
friending people. Just, you know, don't be cheesy about it. You got to be authentic, but you, you know, and that takes time. There's no doubt that takes time, but I, that's, that's some advice I would, I would give. That's brilliant advice. I know for me being a real estate investor, as soon as I stopped telling people that I worked for, I, I did IT work for the county government at the sheriff's office. As soon as I stopped telling people that, that was my job. And I started telling people I'm a real estate investor. Even before I had any properties, I said, well, I'm a real estate investor. Even though 100% of my money comes from my job, my, my part-time job, I'm a full-time investor because it's my own mindset. And right. when I started doing that, people started really knowing me as a real estate investor. And so people always say, well, it's hard because it's hard to invest in real estate because you don't have money. Like you need money to buy properties. And I'm like, yeah, you do, but it doesn't have to be your money. I have so many people wanting to give me money to invest for them. And obviously they would get a return. I would invest for them and then they would make money because the network, and it takes time. It definitely takes time and getting to know more people. So I think that's great advice. Now, Ryan, what is one bit of advice that you would go back and give your younger self? Let's say, you know, high school-ish age, but just any, could be business, could be life, anything else. You know, it's hard because I want to say that I felt like I'm, I knew more than I did when I was young. Like, I want to say when I came in, I felt like I was, oh, this is going to be easy, not easy, but like, I got this. I don't know if I would change that though, because that's what, even though you look back and realize kind of you were young and dumb and felt like you knew way more than you really did, that, that kind of drives you, that kind of drives you to take the risks. And then, and then that drives those risks that you take, start to kind of slap you in the face and go, you don't know as much as you think, you know, and that's a learning experience that I, as I look back through all those learning experiences, I go, that was very valuable. So my first thing is it, it, it does bug me a little bit that when I, when I look back, how I felt like I knew more than I really did, I should have been, I wish I was smarter about that. I needed more experience and, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so, but, but I wouldn't, I, now that I think about it, I wouldn't change it. So I, I don't know if that's an answer or not, but that's, that's my answer to you. No, I think, I think it's great. I know as I've gotten older, I've, well, when I was younger, I had a lot, took a lot of risks and I had a, lot, a really high risk tolerance. Now that I'm older, I got four kids and I really don't need to take risks. I don't take as many <laughs> risks as possible now, but when you're young and dumb, you just don't realize the risks are out there. So you just push forward. So I think, yeah, it's yeah. great. Now, what is one nonfiction book that you would recommend that we should read? Atlas Shrugged. Oh, I love that book. That is such a good book. Without any hesitation, Atlas Shrugged. That, oh, is, that is a very good book, a long one too. I actually did the audiobook, and most audiobooks are like nine to 10 CDs. This was 34 <laughs> CDs long, it, but it's absolutely phenomenal. I absolutely love that book. Is there, is there a re specific reason why you like it? You know, partly, I think it was partly the time in my life when I read it first. Um, it told me things I already knew that I couldn't, that I couldn't express. Like Ayn Rand, the author, she, she was such a visionary of her time to see what she saw. Um, she was bold enough because even, even, even some of the most capitalistic people are kind of like, you know, there's some things that in there are, that are uh, a little on the edge, but she was so bold and so forward thinking as a matter of fact, I mean, of all the, she's technically a philosopher, but she, her philosophy had a lot to do with economics, but she, there's, I don't think there's ever been a stray from the norm in economics or philosophy in, in what she put in in what's called objectivism. It's so different than anything else. And it's, it's become such a, there's such a following for it. People, some people would say cult following, but the fact is it's huge. I mean, when people, when, when, when we went through coronavirus in, in March and April, and in general, when we go through hard times in America, that book just sells through the roof because people need something like that to help understand how to move through this. Uh, how, how to move through hard times and how to, how to deal with these types, difficult types of situations. Um, man, it's a thousand page book. I've read probably six or seven times. I could have an entire podcast on it talking about it, but I'm not going to waste your time or your listeners time on that, but it's a book worth reading for sure. It's absolutely a brilliant book. So I would wholeheartedly agree and recommend it to everybody else. Now, one of the last questions is what is one tool? It could be an app on your phone or a piece of paper and a pen what is one thing in your life that you use 
on a day-to-day basis that would be beneficial for us to look into? One of the, maybe one of the most important things I've, uh, decisions I've made, the app itself is, um, is Instagram. Everybody knows Instagram, right? Okay, well, what do you, where are you going with this? For many, many years, especially coming out of the military, um, being the silent warrior, I, was be, I stayed behind my business. I, my business was out in front and I just did the stuff behind the scenes. Um, but I don't know, the last six months or so, I've started talking about just the way I feel about things. I have my own personal Instagram. We have company Instagrams and all that stuff, but I have my own personal, and I have, I have others. I have um, LinkedIn, but Instagram is the primary one. And it's, and it's something I do every day now. I post every day, I get on there and interact. And it showed me a lot more than I ever thought it would. It helps me interact with people that I wasn't interacting with before. Not just customers of mine, but just people in general. What are they thinking? What do people think? Honestly, like people that I don't know, my circle that I hang around with 99% of the time, what are other people thinking? You know, how do other people navigate through life? And then I put some of my ideas out there and people comment on my ideas. Like, that's a cool idea or that's great. I love it or this is stupid. (laughs) And it really starts to put perspective in like, you know, most of us get into this, this world where we're just in this kind of echo chamber. And um, it's helped me to expand my thinking and um, in a lot of ways, personally and business. Business Business-wise, it helps me understand what people and customers, which people are potential customers, how they think and how to engage with them in a meaningful way. And personally, just um, getting my expressing the things that I care about in a public forum. It's almost liberating. I know it's a cheesy answer, Instagram, uh, and most people are doing it out there. But for me, it was, um, uh, it was great. I know this show isn't for me. It's for your, for your listeners. So (laughs) this is probably a terrible answer, but there you go. Well, no, yeah, (laughs) I know. And I agree. And that um, even though some people would probably not use that, as an answer, I think it's actually refreshing to hear because I personally, I, I'm not a big fan of social media just for me in general. It gets yeah. really, really irritating, but I didn't have that perspective, like being able to communicate with people because there are, it's really polarizing how some people are like, you are the most, you're the dumbest person I've ever heard. You're, you should go kill yourself. I'm like, well, that's kind of rude. You shouldn't be saying things like that. But the next person, man, this guy is right on. I really love what he's saying. And so being able to get out of, uh, you know, your own little bubble to, to actually see what more people think, I think that's, that's really cool. Okay, so man, Ryan, McMillan, you give us so much great insights. I know people are going to run and reach out to you and even check out your rifle stocks. How can they find you? How can they, you know, look you up online or anything like that? Yeah, so Graybo is G R A Y B O E dot com. Simple. Uh, we have an Instagram and a Facebook that are our primary accounts, and they're all at Graybo. Um, so just if you're interested in that, me personally. I'm primarily on Instagram. It's Ryan underscore M C underscore M I L L A N. Um, or if you just search Ryan McMillan, I think I'm one of the first ones that come up. Um, I have a LinkedIn too. Just search Ryan McMillan. You'll find me. I have the same profile picture across all my platforms. So uh, it's pretty easy. And I'd love to see everybody, you know, come kind of follow me and I'll follow, I follow a lot of people back. Um, Cause I like to see what people are thinking. I like to see what people are doing. So yeah, um, that would be great. If you guys, you guys wanted to kind of come hang out in my, virtual space. That'd be awesome. Awesome, Ryan. Hey, thank you so much for your service. I know being a Navy SEAL is phenomenal, in my opinion, to be like, you have to be a phenomenally like athlete as well as your mind has to be strong. So really, really appreciate you being on as well as sharing so much great insights into your business. So thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate it. All right, man. Take care.